So as the reports came in the Boston Post that 45 were killed, the Globe said no, 250. Uh, the Daily News in New York, 322 dead. The Daily Record says 390. And finally, the Herald says no death mounts are up over 500 people and 100,000 homeless. So you had 80% of New England homes lost power. The peak storm surge was 17 feet among, above the normal high tide. 50 foot waves were seen at Gloucester. 700 deaths, 600 in New England. 63,000 left homeless. 20,000 miles of power wire was knocked down. 8,900 homes and buildings were destroyed. 3,300 boats were lost. 26,000 automobiles were lost. Two billion trees destroyed. $6.2 million, that's 1938 dollars. I guess today with the dollar being worthless, it's probably up near a trillion. Shirley Ann Gatch was born at 3.28 p.m. on Eastern Long Island Hospital just as the roof blew off and flooded the delivery room. So at this point in time, I want to ask, was there anybody here born on September 21st, 1938? Okay, I usually have. There are a lot of premature births there due to the low air pressure. So just finally, I, I've had people stand up. I was born that day. Uh, Great Atlantic Hurricane, as I mentioned, 1944. There's the track. Edna, 1954, Carol, 1954, Diane, 1955, Donna, 1960, and of course uh, the Hurricane of 38 stacks in the top 10. So I want to close out here and, uh, and talk to some of you. Um, here are my resources, The Wind to Shake the World, Everett Allen, of course Sutton C. R. A. Scotty, Cherie Burns, The Great Hurricane of 1938. And Aaron Gutsuzian's The Hurricane of 1938. I want to thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. Now, this is where you school me. I want to hear about your personal recollections of the storm. Normally, I'm going to tell you up front, I'm going to get a storm of somebody, I think, standing out on the front lawn when their mom calls them in or dad, just as they call them in, that branch falls down. I usually hear that story. Of, again, in the theme of province. So Yvette is going to go around the room. If you have a question or a comment, she want to talk about a falling branch, raise your hand and we'd love to hear it. If you just uh, state the town that you were in, uh, we'd really appreciate that. Again, thank you. Yes? I was at Huntington, Long Island, age 10. And uh, the main thing I remember is trees bouncing off the roof of our house. We lived in the woods. Wow, and of course, uh, New England was very wooded you know, back in the 1930s. Does anybody else have a comment or a rec? Yes, yes, sir. You can sit. We're all friends here. I was uh, 16 years old, uh, and that morning I, I played a bad game of tennis, which was not unusual for me, and, uh, uh, but I, I could blame it on the wind. That afternoon, I was just looking out my bedroom window, looking at the tree right, right next to the house. And there was a, a tenement house, oh, about uh, 50 feet, feet away, and the wind was blowing and the tree swayed, and I, and I was getting sort of sleepy, it was sort of rhythmic, and I thought, wouldn't it be funny if the tree fell over? And, 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 and then the next came a big, big puff of wind, and the earth rose. And I thought, my God, what's going on? And then the said, tree settled back and it blew once more. And then the, the, the soil came up, and the tree crashed into the house next door. And I got rather excited, so I rushed out in the street. Everybody else was out there. Everybody was, was standing in the street watching the, the trees fall down. It was very interesting. Wow. And of course, the moral of the story is be careful what you wish for. Right? Um, Jane, Jane Smith, would you like to tell us, uh, please uh, uh, tell us about uh, your recollections. Jane, I got to meet before uh, tonight's talk, and she told a very wonderful first-hand account. I'd like her to read some of uh, her accounts now. Jane, if you want to pick it up. Well, all right. We've certainly heard a wonderful stories such as I've never heard. And mine is only a one-person story. 
because in September, with one week left before it time to go back to school, I bicycled down on a lovely fall day to go for one last swim. Everyone had gone back to work or school, so no one else was on the beach at 10 o'clock in the morning. The waves were enormous and challenging, and the skies along the horizon took on a strange, ominous mixture of pink with layers of orange and gray. It had been a wonderful summer, and having turned a certain age so that I could now drive a car, I had become quite a proficient swimmer, so I could hardly wait to fly up in those big waves and ride down again from the dizzy heights, up and down and up and down. It was not an act of bravado that impelled me to run into the surf. It was just a desire to be carefree and a determination to explore the high waves, these bigger than ever. As I ran into the surf, I stepped on something, soft and unrecognizable, reached down and brought up a dead seagull, without a thought, tossed it aside and rode up on the mammoth wave. I get down and up again. The next wave, crashed on top of me, swimming me further and further out into the swells. With the following wave, I was swirled, most weightless, along with sand and shells into a green room under the sea. Fighting for a breath of air, I struggled to the top, caught again by forces of under out of my control. Unbeknownst to me, my mother's friend, Mrs. Dolly, was standing on the lawn of our beach club, watching my little white bathing cap heading further and further out to she hurried inside, called the nearby Coast Guard station at Point Judith, who fortunately were monitoring the storm. When they saw me, they came up after me and dragged me over the gunnels into their small boat. Minus my children are horrified. Minus bathing suit and cap. Thoroughly chastised. So the rest goes on more things that you have said, but that was just a one-person experience of what it was like to be caught in a hurricane. Well, talk about Providence and luck, but somebody saw you because you were getting called an excellent job by the undertow. Yes? We've been talking about the uh, riparian damages, and I'd like to talk just a second about what happened up in northern New England, because as you all know, the storm went up the Connecticut River, and I had just returned to my college in Hanover, New Hampshire, begin my sophomore year. Classes hadn't started, so we had nothing to do but roam around the campus and perhaps sip a little bit of beer, which some of the Dartmouth students would want to do. And I want to tell you that storm coming up the Connecticut River right blew down tree after tree after tree and all the big elms old trees around the campus and tarp tumbled as we watched them. Following that, the government moved in and it made it possible for all the trees up and down the area had been, which had been blown over. They were sawed into, log, into logs and put in all the ponds and lakes in New Hampshire and Vermont and that whole area. And we watched them for years until finally those logs, which had been financed by the government, were taken out and sawed into lumber and saved. But <clears throat> most of the stories of the great hurricane were about the shore. And this was about the North Woods, which really got it. Wonderful account. Time for, for one more event? Yeah, definitely. Two. Okay, two? Okay. I'll let, I'll let you decide when we're done. Yeah, okay. Oh, excuse me. Oh. Sorry. You all right? One thing, sir, with all, you talk about the fallen trees, um, I do a lecture called the Great Bright Rock Fire on April 21st, 1941. 200 fires raged across Massachusetts that unseasonably warm day. And a lot of that fallen trees that served as kindling from the Great Hurricane of 1938. Yes. Uh, I was a, am a Rhode Islander, as is Jane, and we spent our summers in Jamestown, the island, and we had just gone back to Providence, but Great Grandma Knight was still there, alone in the house with, I guess, some servants. But anyway, the ferry boat 
landed on the front lawn, and the Knights being people that loved porches. They had porches around the first floor, 